G'day everyone, today we're going to be taking a bird's eye look at Ross, at some of the core components and how they fit together. As a practical example, I'm going to be connecting to these two LiDARs and showing you how we would interact with them using Ross. We're going to be moving pretty quickly, so if there's anything confusing, take a look at the blog post linked in the description for more details. To start off, what is ROS? Although ROS stands for Robot Operating System, it's not actually an OS, but it's a set of common libraries and tools with which we can build complex robotic systems. New versions of ROS, called Distributions, are released in May each year, and are designed to run on the latest LTS version of Ubuntu. Although ROS can run on other Linux distributions, and even Mac and Windows, a beginner should definitely start with Ubuntu because it's supported best on that. The development of ROS is overseen by a group called Open Robotics. A couple of years ago, the project went through a huge upgrade, and so releases since then have been called ROS2. Now, a lot of the documentation and tutorials and stuff online is designed for ROS1, but ROS1 isn't receiving updates anymore, and so these tutorials are going to focus on ROS2, specifically LTS releases of ROS2 running on Ubuntu. If you are reading any ROS1 documentation, it's worth being aware that most of the concepts have remained the same between ROS1 and ROS2, but the actual programs and commands that you run will be a little bit different, so you just got to be careful. Now a ROS system is made up of a whole bunch of smaller programs that all run at the same time and talk to each other. These programs are called nodes, and they're just like any other command line program on Linux, except that they use the ROS library and other parts of the ROS ecosystem are aware of them. A node is typically designed to perform one specific task as part of the larger system. These could be things like reading data from a sensor, sending control signals to a motor, receiving operator controls from a joystick, displaying a visualization to an operator, or computing a trajectory to follow. Each ROS node on a computer and on other computers in the same network all form part of a ROS network where they can see each other. This gives us heaps of flexibility because it's just as easy to develop systems that run entirely on a single machine or with components distributed between different machines. Two ROS commands we need to know when we're working with nodes are how to run a node and how to see which nodes are running. Here I've got an RP LiDAR connected to a Raspberry Pi, and that's on the same network as my dev machine. I've got two terminals open to the Raspberry Pi via SSH, and one terminal locally on the dev machine. I'm going to start by running the LiDAR driver on the Pi. To run a package, we type ROS2 run, then the name of the package, and then the name of the node. So in this case, the package is called RP LiDAR ROS, and the node is RP LiDAR node and you can see it starts to run the node and it's communicating with the LiDAR. To check that the node is running on the other terminal which remember is on a different computer I'm going to type ROS2 node list. We can see the RP LiDAR node is running. The way ROS nodes communicate with each other is with topics and messages. A topic is a named location where a node can publish a message to. These nodes are called publishers and then other nodes called subscribers can subscribe to that topic and receive the messages. A node can be a publisher for one message at the same time as being a subscriber for another message. And we don't even need to worry about whether the publisher and the subscriber are on the same computer or not. ROS takes care of all of that for us. All we need to do is specify the name of the topic and the type of message that we're going to be publishing or subscribing to. The topic system is great because it lets us write smaller, simpler nodes that are good at one thing and can communicate with each other to solve larger problems. For example, the RP LiDAR node only needs to know how to talk to the laser hardware and publish a laser scan message. It doesn't care what anyone else does with that message afterwards. Likewise, a node that utilizes the LiDAR data doesn't need to know how to communicate with every different LiDAR model out there. It just needs to subscribe to a topic that's publishing laser scan messages. The two most useful commands when working with topics are listing what topics are available and Echo, which lets us pretend to be a subscriber and see what's being published on a topic. So here on the dev machine, I'll type ROS2 topic list, and we can see that the scan topic's being published. Then I'll type ROS2 topic echo, the name of the topic, so slash scan, and then I'm gonna add no array so that we don't print out all of the laser data and fill up our terminal. So if I run that, we can see that it's ticking over, new messages are coming through from the laser and being published to the scan topic by the driver node. Now topics are great for a node to share many messages with anyone who wants to listen, but sometimes we want a sort of single message request reply communication method. ROS provides a way to do this and that's called services. Services let us uh, send a node one particular piece of information and get some information back or sometimes just trigger an event. For example, while our LiDAR is operating, the motor is constantly spinning around. But if we know that our robot will be parked in one spot for a while, 
we might want to shut off the motor to save battery. The scanner driver we're using provides a service called Stop Motor. It doesn't require any information and it doesn't return a result. So it'll take an empty message in, stop the motor, then return an empty message back. To see what services are available to us, we can type ROS2 service list and sure enough, we can see the start motor and stop motor services there. To call a service manually, we type ROS2 service call, then the name of the service, so stop motor, and then the message that we want to send, in this case, an empty service message. And you can see it receives the message, it receives the service and stops the motor. Two powerful features that ROS gives us when working with nodes are parameters and remapping. Parameters are a way for us to change the behavior of a node. For example, with our LiDARs, if I had two LiDARs connected, then each one would need to be on a different serial port and the driver node would need to know which serial port to connect to for which LiDAR. When the programmer is writing a node, they can specify whatever parameters they want the user to be able to configure. Remapping lets us change the names of the topics that a node is publishing or subscribing to, or other named things like services. This is most useful when we've got two nodes that need to communicate but are expecting a topic to have a different name. For example, our driver node might be publishing on scan, but some other node might be expecting the topic to be called laser scan. Another time that we might want to use remapping of topics is in the case where we had two LiDARs, they would both be trying to publish to scan. So we might want to specify one LiDAR to publish to scan one and another LiDAR to publish to scan two. The way that we specify parameters and remapping is we add ROS args to the end of our run command and then dash P for parameters and dash R for remapping. So I'm going to run the driver node again. This time I'm going to add ROS args and specify the serial port and I'm going to remap scan to scan one. And we should see it keeps running, but now if we run ROS2 topic list, we can see that it's publishing to scan one instead. When we're trying to avoid naming conflicts, remapping individual topics isn't really the best way to do it because there might be heaps of different topics and it's hard to remember to get them all. Instead, something that Ross lets us do is put a node inside a namespace. This will remap everything for that node and keeps things nicely separated. So I'm going to plug in the second lighter and then we're going to go ROS2 run RP lighter. Now to remap the namespace, we're going to go underscore underscore ns and then specify the namespace. So now if we run ROS2 topic list, we can see that the second driver is running in the scanner2 namespace. Its scans are remapped and all of its services have been remapped as well. Now when we're working on a ROS project, we're often running the same nodes over and over again with the same sets of parameters and remappings, and sometimes it can be hard to remember to do it all and it gets a bit tedious. To help with this, ROS provides a scripting system called launching, which lets us launch a whole lot of nodes with whatever parameters and remapping that we need, and we can do it over and over again if we need to. Now in ROS1, the launch scripts were written using a fairly easy to understand XML syntax. In ROS2, although you can use the XML syntax, Currently, the more powerful and preferred method is through a Python scripting system. Unfortunately, the Python scripts are a little bit more complicated to read, but they are a lot better. So up here on the screen, you can see an example of a launch file that would run the nodes that we've already seen in this tutorial. We can see the package and node names, the parameters, the topic remapping, and the namespace remapping. To run a launch file from a package, we do the same thing as when we're running a node, except we use the word launch instead of the word run. Now, it is best to put your launch files in packages, but we can also just write launch files and run them straight off the system. Now, I've already got a launch file saved into this directory, so I can run ros2 launch testlaunch.launch.py, and you can see what it'll do is it's going to launch both versions of the node, and it's going to have their output text interleaved with little bits in front of it to tell you which lines are being printed from which node. Then in the other terminal, we can run ros2 topic list and again we can see that both nodes are running and publishing just like when we ran them individually. Okay so we know that a ROS project is made up of all these nodes and launch files and parameters and whatever else but how are these all organized? The first level of organization is called a package. 
Now, a package is a way for us to group together a whole lot of related files, either so that we can use them again in a different project later, or just to keep them grouped. Um, and you can put anything you want in a package. It could be nodes, launch files, models for a robot, documentation, whatever you want. As well as its own files, a package has a list of other packages that it depends on, packages that it needs to do its job, and those are called dependencies. For example, we might have a package called scanner driver that contains a node for communicating with a laser and a launch file that runs that node with some common parameters. This package would have very few dependencies. Apart from the core ROS stuff, it only needs to know about laser scan messages so that it can create them. This scanner driver package could then be used in many different projects. We might also make another package called dual scanner robot, which contains only a launch file to run two scanner drivers, mapping them to two separate topics. This package would then have to depend on scanner driver. We're going to look at how to make our own packages in the next tutorial, but in the meantime, where do we get packages from and how do they know where to find each other? Normally when we install software using something like apt, all the files go to special locations on the computer where the computer knows where to find them. For example, whenever we run a command on the terminal, the computer has a list of paths that it's checking to see if it can find that command. Now ROS could use these system paths if it wanted to, but the thing is some people want to have multiple versions of ROS installed at the same time and be able to swap between them. Now there are other ways that we can solve this problem using virtual machines or docker containers or something like Venv or Conda in Python, but ROS has its own solution to this problem. When you install a ROS distribution, it'll create a directory in slash opt slash ROS which contains all of the packages and config files that are part of that distribution. For example, slash opt slash ROS slash foxy. Any extra packages that you install using rostep or apt install are going to end up in this directory. Additionally, a file is created in this directory called setup.bash. This contains all of the information the system needs to temporarily add the ROS directory to the list of expected system locations. So when you first open a terminal, it will know nothing about ROS until you source your installation by running source slash opt slash ROS slash foxy slash setup. Bash. We usually add this line to the bottom of our bashrc file, which is executed every time a terminal first opens, to ensure that our ROS installation is always visible. We sometimes call this base ROS installation the underlay, because other packages that we write ourselves will go on top of it. Now it is possible to have other things that are the underlay, but that's only in more complex systems. For now, whenever we use the word underlay, we're going to be referring to the system ROS installation. So that covers ROS packages that are installed to the system, but what about our own ones? When we work on ROS projects, we create a special folder called a workspace to keep all our packages in. You can organize this however you want, but it generally makes sense to have one workspace per project. And inside this are going to be all the packages that we need to compile. So either packages we've written ourselves or that we've downloaded off GitHub. Uh, this doesn't include the packages that we've installed to the system because they're part of the underlay that's visible to all of our workspaces. If we were to build our code using normal build tools, they wouldn't know where to find all the ROS components and then once they were built, ROS wouldn't know where to find our packages. This is where the ROS build tool called Colcon comes in. When we use Colcon to build our workspace, it'll take all our source files from a source directory, build them to a build directory, and then install them to an install directory. This isn't too different from other build tools. However, it also creates a setup.bash file with all the information the system needs to know how to find our packages, just like we had for the system installation. So then every time we open a terminal to run code from that project, we need to source the workspace by running source and then path to the setup.bash. We sometimes call this the overlay because it goes over the underlay. With the overlay sourced, ROS will first look for packages in our workspace, the overlay, before looking at the system installation, the underlay. This way we can test against modified or updated versions of system packages without having to uninstall them. We don't usually want to automatically source this using our bashrc file since we need to keep each workspace separate for each project. There's nothing stopping you from stacking overlays on top of each other, with each overlay treating the previous one as an underlay, but you'd really only need that for more complex projects. When we build using Colcon, it doesn't matter whether the package is written in C++ or Python, and whether the dependencies are simple or complicated, Colcon just figures out all of this for us. It might seem a little bit complicated at first, but as soon as you're working on anything other than the simplest project, it really helps to have a build tool like this. The last thing that we're going to talk about is QoS. Now if you know what QoS is, you might be thinking, that's not a beginner concept, why would you include it here? 
But the problem is that QoS can actually be the cause of a whole lot of issues that a beginner can run into and they won't even know that that's what's causing their problem. So we're just going to take a quick look at it. QoS, or quality of service, is a new feature in ROS2 that lets publishers and subscribers agree on a set of rules and conditions for how they're going to use a topic. For example, for OneNode, it might be really important that it receives absolutely every message, even if that means getting a bit of a delay. Whereas for an, another node, it might want just the latest message all the time, even if that means sometimes it'll miss some. But if a publisher and a subscriber don't have a compatible set of QoS parameters, then they just won't communicate. And if you didn't write the node yourself, it's not always obvious what parameters it's using. So sometimes your nodes just won't be talking and you'll have no idea why. For example, on the Pi, I'm gonna publish a message that just contains the number 42 to the topic test with the reliability best effort. Now, if I try and sub subscribe to that topic using the same reliability, you'll see I'm getting messages come through. But if I tried to subscribe to that topic using the reliable setting, nothing's coming through. And I don't really have any indication as to why. We can use ROS2 topic info with the verbose flag to check the reliability level, but it's still a bit hard to tell. So just watch out for that one. It probably won't crop up too much, but it can bite you. Thanks for watching. If you found this helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe. If you've got any more questions, let us know in the comments below, or you can head over to the blog post linked in the description for more details. Otherwise, I'll see you next time.